So today we are going to talk about some of my favorite books of all time. There are no series on this list. I chose individual books and I won't be making any caveats, no honorable mentions. We're just going straight into the list. So number 10 is A Treatise of Human Nature by David Hume. A Treatise of Human Nature is one of the most astounding works of philosophy that has ever been written. Many people will say that it is surpassed by later works by Hume. This book, in fact, was not well received when it was released. Hume himself described it as falling stillborn from the press. And many people claim that the arguments are more sophisticated in Hume's later work, like the inquiry. However, I think that sometimes we are too quick to dismiss the treatise. I remember taking an entire academic seminar on the treatise of human nature and just seeing how sophisticated the arguments were. The problem was that I often felt like Hume was moving a little bit too fast. And so it was very difficult for the reader to pick up on the subtlety and sophistication of those arguments. When I read this book, I fell in love. I fell in love both with Hume as a writer. He's tremendous. There's a reason that he was famous in his time. Also, I fell in love with one of the main themes of this book, which is skepticism. This isn't skepticism in like the Richard Dawkins sense. This is skepticism in the sense of not being sure if the external world even exists, or really investigating the limits of human knowledge and finding that knowledge is actually significantly more limited than we might have originally expected. There's a kind of humility to the position that Hume ends up taking, where frankly, there are many things that we just can't know. And what we have to do, instead of pretending like we can know them, we have to instead be okay with the inherent uncertainty. The human condition is one where certainty is incredibly difficult to achieve. That's why even though I know a lot of people who aren't philosophers might not want to go and read David Hume, I think that you can still learn something from it, even if you find philosophy to be a little bit tedious or maybe a little bit overwhelming. Namely, Hume teaches us something about being human. Number nine is... Anathem by Neil Stevenson, which made it pretty high up in my list of science fiction books, which I'll link to down below. Anathem really just checks a lot of boxes for me. I like standalone works of science fiction or fantasy. While series are great, I really do love it if you can contain a story into, into just one book, even if it is a very long book. And honestly, even though I love a lot of science fiction and fantasy series, one of the things I find is that the individual books of those series never make it onto a top 10 list for me. Because even if the series as a whole is tremendous, I always find some weaknesses in the individual books. So a nice standalone is just a really pleasant thing. Two, I love the philosophical explorations here. Really the dominant theme in Anathem is the debate between nominalism and realism in metaphysics. I'll link down to some articles down below if you want to know what that is. And then putting it into a context of an Earth-like environment with some kind of scientist, philosopher, monks who have to go on some big expedition, mostly to figure out, to push the limits of human knowledge, really. It's just thrilling. I'm a big fan of Stevenson's prose. I am a big fan of the way that Stevenson does world building in this book. To be honest, I believe that this is Stevenson's best work. Number eight is The Confessions by St. Augustine. The Confessions by St. Augustine is a work that I think gets overlooked by a lot of people now. If you're reading sort of in Christian history, for instance, or you're interested in like church history or theology or something, you'll definitely read The Confessions. It's, it's a classic sort of in those fields. But a lot of people have basically disregarded a lot of early medieval writing and especially early medieval theology as not relevant to us now, especially anyone who isn't religious, they're not going to really find much in it, right? But I think that's wrong. I think actually you can find many interesting lessons and ideas in St. Augustine's writings, even if you're an atheist. St. Augustine is, is wrestling with his childhood and with his life, and while he's trying to find God in that, Oftentimes he's wondering about the absence of God, about how he has not felt the presence of God, and about how he has felt alone, or like he is wandering, or like he is searching for something. There are examinations of human moral psychology, like the famous scene with the pears, where Augustine realizes that he did something wrong, not because he wanted to do it, but because he wanted to do something wrong. There are all sorts of discussions about Augustine's relationship to his mother. It seemed to be a very loving one, but also troubled at times. There are reflections on mentorship, like when Augustine meets Ambrose, and about moving to new places as Augustine was trying to make his way in the Roman Empire. 
Now I want to take a moment to thank my sponsor, AG1, for making this video possible. I start every morning with AG1. It has in fact replaced my morning cup of coffee. Now when I wake up, I grab a glass of water, a scoop of AG1, I mix it, and I drink it, and I'm good to go. I feel like I get that early burst of energy that I need to start off right, but I also know that I'm supporting my health with AG1. That's because AG1 is packed with vitamins and nutrients and is made with some of the best whole food source ingredients. I've had stomach problems and digestion problems for my entire adult life, and I've never been able to figure out a solution that really seemed to work for me. And as I started working on my diet, things started to get a little bit better, but I wanted to see if I could do something else to maybe have a consistent support for my digestive system and my gut health. And that's why I started drinking AG1. I found that I have an improved digestion system. I have a better sense of my gut health, I drink less coffee, and I like the fact that every morning I'm just starting it with a burst of nutrition. Just one more note, something I love about AG1, AG1 has recently announced that they are phasing out plastic scoops, these disposable plastic scoops, and instead they're transitioning to using a metal scoop that they just send you once and you have to keep. I love the fact that they're cutting down on plastic waste. It's exactly what I like to see from a company. So not only is it a product that I like, but they're doing other things that I definitely feel like I can support. Check out my link down in the description, try out AG1, maybe make it a part of your morning routine like I have. Number seven is The Intellectual Life by AD Searchalonge. The Intellectual Life is essentially a manual for how to be an intellectual, but it is also a reflection on discipline and on routine. It talks about note-taking and the role of notes in a scholar's like. It also relates being an intellectual to higher things. Sertiange himself was a Jesuit priest, so he writes it from that perspective, but he's trying to connect being an intellectual and having a sense of vocation to a sense of a higher purpose or a higher good or pursuing the truth. I've talked before on this channel about how I used to consume a lot of product activity content. And one of the things that I would do is try to figure out how I could maximize or optimize my productivity. Sertiange is sort of the anti-productivity writer, but yet I found that when I started making my life fit the pattern that Sertiange prescribes a little bit more, I was actually getting more done and it was more meaningful and thoughtful work. And this is why I think anyone could read this and learn quite a bit from it. And it's funny how a lot of his writing actually it's sort of technology agnostic. Obviously he's writing in a time before computers, but if you wanted to use some kind of like note-taking system or whatever it is that you do on your computer, you could still take a lot of the insights from Sertiange and then sort of move into that. We don't have to take a stand on analog versus digital to get something out of this really tremendous book. This book is really becoming kind of a yearly reread for me. It's about time for me to read it again because I just find it so inspirational when I pick it up. It, it makes me want to be a better thinker. It makes me want to be a better reader and a writer, and it makes me want to simply pursue an excellence. Number six on my list is Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue. McIntyre, by the way, is the only living philosopher on this list. After Virtue arguably is about ethics. Its subtitle is A Study in Moral Theory, but really it's about moral theory itself, not so much about what ethics is, what is right and wrong, but about how moral theory and ethical talk seems to have lost its way. I think the key problem that McIntyre is trying to figure out is how do we make sense of moral terms and how do we make sense of words like good, bad, right, wrong, just, unjust, and all of these other morally laden terms in a way that we can all agree upon because he senses that moral disagreement often has been turned into kind of screaming matches in the modern age. Mm -hmm. He calls them rather shrill. And I think in the back of his mind, McIntyre is wondering, how do I make sure or how can we try our best to make ethics about persuasion and community and figuring out how to live together and not about exercises of power so that one person's will can dominate another's. It's a very historically informed book, so you will see investigations of Aristotle, of Thomas Aquinas, but also of Nietzsche and Hume and Kierkegaard. And his assessment and his reading of the history of philosophy is really quite interesting. We're almost the hero of a certain kind of approach to morality is Nietzsche, where he takes what Hume starts and he doesn't flinch from the conclusion. And I think McIntyre kind of views it as we either need to figure out how to recover and also transform moral terms into our present age in a way that makes sense, or 
Nietzsche is the only reasonable alternative. And he does not tell us exactly how to do this. Instead, he leaves on a kind of optimistic note, but still one that is unresolved. This book reignited a lot of love I had for moral theory. It made me think about ethics again from an academic context where I'd largely not done that, especially when I was in graduate school, I was thinking about language and logic and things like this. It also kind of provides a survey on the history of moral theory, though I'm sure many people would say that McIntyre has such a slanted or kind of weird view on it that it's difficult to fully trust it, but still it gives you it lets you know where he's coming from, and it's really nice to see a thinker who grounds himself so thoroughly in the history of philosophy, so you feel like you have something to latch onto when you're reading it. Number five, we have the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Douglass is the great anti-slavery writer, the great abolitionist of American history. Sure, there were many other advocates, there were many other writers, there were many other people who were doing their best to rid us of this like horrendous institution, but Douglass just puts it in such a way that I, I find so compelling and I, I, I my heart swells when I think about um, Douglas's courage and then also his ability to remain determined in spite of living in a world that wants to see him fail. Douglas was prevented from learning how to read and he essentially taught himself by bribing young white boys to teach him a little bit of reading and then he just pursued it. And one of the great things in this book, a piece that I find so inspiring, is that Douglas eventually finds this, this book called The Columbian Orator, which has some classic oration, but also a lot of sort of oration that's done in the style of classic orator. So it's not all, I think, historically authentic. And it, and it has some, some Roman oration, but also things from American history. And Douglas reads it, and it's as if something has come alive in him. He now is like reminded of his humanity. And one of the things that I love about classics and about great books is I think that they teach us how to be human. The world wanted Douglas to forget that he was human. He talks about this so much in his book about the dehumanizing effect of slavery, both on the enslaved and also on the slave owners. And then Douglas reads these great books and he is reminded of the truth. He then goes on to use his words to argue against this horrific institution and to shape American history. Again, this is one of these books that I like to go back to every once in a while because it is so inspirational. Number four is Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, which is a book that I only recently read. And I was a little hesitant to add it to my top 10 list because I had read it so recently and I was afraid maybe I was just very fond of it because I had just finished it. And also because Cormac McCarthy sadly died. I had read some Cormac McCarthy before, but I was finally getting around to reading Blood Meridian, and I actually got the news that he died when I was about halfway through the book. We talk about this concept of the great American novel. We might think of To Kill a Mockingbird, or Their Eyes Were Watching God, or The Great Gatsby, maybe something by Hemingway. Moby Dick would also be another great example. These are novels which are often very regional in character, but also capture something broader about the American spirit. And it usually takes us time to realize just how insightful they are. In fact, some people who have argued about the great American novel argue that one of its features is that the book cannot be fully recognized in its own time. And Blood Meridian, of course, when it was first published, was not a big success. I think that Blood Meridian should be counted as one of the great American novels. It is horrifically violent, and yet it is also stunningly beautiful, and capturing brutality and beauty in the same book, sometimes on the same page, is, I think, going to always be a part of the great American novel. This is a Western that is almost unlike any other Western. It is difficult to describe. All I can really say is just go read it. I was calling the prose the frontier Shakespeare because it is beautiful, it is melodic, it is interesting, but it's also written in McCarthy's standard style, which rids, which gets rid of a lot of punctuation, which uses odd kind of vocabulary choices, especially in his earlier novels, and really focuses on rhythm and diction and not sort of conformity to what we would call standard grammatical rules. What you end up getting is actually prose that looks almost like it was written by someone who was maybe uneducated, but it's actually an elevation of rural American speech into something tremendous. The great literary critic Harold Bloom, by the way, called McCarthy the true heir of Faulkner and of Melville. And I, I love that characterization of, of McCarthy and I think Bloom was spot on. Number three on my list is The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin. This is 
one of the greatest books ever written. Obviously, I think very highly of it by putting it at number three. Ursula K. Le Guin, of course, is my favorite science fiction writer. The Dispossessed did a lot of things for me. One, it was an early book for me where when I was getting back into reading fiction after I was going through grad school and things, The Dispossessed just kind of sparked something within me that made me want to read more. Le Guin can actually capture deep themes and really kind of intellectual ideas and then put them on, on the page and then sort of weave them in, not just as dialogue that the characters might say, but actually into the form and structure of the book. And, and so the, the Dispossessed is this organic unity where interesting explorations of anarchism are coming up, but also pushing the limits of thinking through uh, dystopia and utopia. The subtitle of the book is An Ambiguous Utopia. And it's also a very compelling personal story about a scientist who wants to pursue truth and then realizes that as he pursues truth, no matter where he goes, he's going to be used. And I think for so many people, they can feel like as they pursue what they think is best, they realize that everywhere they go, there is an opportunity for exploitation, or is there is someone who wishes them ill, or there is someone who wants to do something that just isn't in conformity with their principles. And we have to make compromises. And Shevek, the main character of this novel, just is a man who doesn't want to make those compromises. He eventually realizes, though, maybe he has to. And again, we're hit by some of that ambiguity. Number two on my list is Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. A lot of people, whenever I talk about Crime and Punishment, they ask me, why not Brothers Karamazov? And I think that the answer is just a kind of personal affection for Crime and Punishment. Every book that I'm picking here is not just a stunning work, but has played some important role in shaping me as a person. Crime and Punishment just came to me at the right time in my life. So then when I read it, I could just be fully engrossed in those worlds, in the mind of Raskolnikov, and then really thinking through all of the themes that Fyodor Dostoevsky wants to, wants to develop. I've said in a previous video that Crime and Punishment is the novel for the anxious mind, and it's also a novel for those who struggle with a guilty conscience, those who let feelings of guilt overwhelm them, and they, they have to find some kind of resolution. Sometimes when you're feeling guilty, you need to realize that there is actually nothing for you to feel guilty about. You need to understand that your guilt is a sort of false impression of how the world is. In other cases, though, we need redemption. We need some kind of absolution. Raskolnikov eventually receives something like that. So even though the novel ends with Raskolnikov in a labor camp, he is in a better place mentally and spiritually than he was even before the inciting incident of the novel. We don't want to just reset the world to as it was before we did something wrong. We actually want to see what we can do to move the world forward, move ourselves forward, help those we've harmed to move forward. And I'd say, where can we find a kind of transformative opportunity when we are writing a past wrong? And then finally, my favorite book of all time is The Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. This book also hit me at the right time. It was the first book where when I took a graduate seminar on it, I read it from start to finish, and we were told to just read this book. We were really told to ignore outside sources for a very long time. Eventually, when you go and do scholarly work, you're gonna have to worry about outside sources, but at least for a little while, we were told just read the book. And when I read the book, I found so much to love. In particular, the exploration of virtue, the idea of human development and teleology became very important for my thinking. I found it was a way that brought ethics down to the reality of humans in a way that a lot of ethical theory that I had read before just didn't. It's compelling, it's interesting, it's difficult. There are many parts of the Nicomachean Ethics I still don't understand. And discerning its relationship to Aristotle's work on politics and thus on ethics to politics in general is still something I think about quite a bit. It's a book that I keep rereading. I've probably read it seven times and I'll probably just read it until I die. And that's the thing about these great books you can just read them until you die. You'll always find something new.